Well, today we turn towards our teaching, Infinite and Intimate, and today's teaching is called Leap. Leap is really uh, dealing with the fact that at some point in the life of faith, there is no logical equation that says yes about, you know, kind of lines up, you put Jesus in a spreadsheet, and you're like, yeah, I believe, and you walk ahead. At some point, it's a leap of faith. At some point, it is that shaky leg of stepping out and leaping into the arms of a loving God. So today, we approach this teaching a little bit differently. It's going to feel different. We're just going to go through the text. I'm going to have the text on the screen. We're going to be talking about it. It's going to be a little more, it's going to feel a little more conversational through the text. But one of the realities is that um, it may not work. (laughs) I think it went okay in first service, but it may not work. So if it doesn't work, I just want to tell you I'm good with failure. Um, But uh, I hope you're able to um, connect with what God's doing because one of the things that the founders, we believe in failing forward in being obedient to God even when the world says it looks like failure. And we're willing to give it a try from up front because I often urge you as a congregation, get into the Word of God, read and study and chew on the Word of God. Today is going to be a bit of a lesson, a practical upfront lesson of how we do it. It may not feel clean and easy in a three-point teaching, but what I hope it does is show you, as it has me, a way to just kind of chew on Scripture and deal with it because we're in chapter 9 of John today, and there are points in this chapter that are incredibly poignant and life-changing and deep theologically and it's sad in some ways, and there's points that are just literally laugh out loud hilarious of what's going on. So I really want you to connect with the Word of God. And the first way we're going to do it is jump right into verse 1 of John chapter 9, and it says, as he, Jesus, went along, he saw a man born blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So clearly, the disciples got a C-minus on bedside manner that week of ministry, right? I mean, have you ever had someone talk about you as though you weren't there? Anybody? Like, can you imagine if I was just standing up here? I'm like, you know, I like Justin a lot. He's a good guy. I mean, he plays a mean guitar. He hits the high notes. Lovely. But, but at work, he cries a lot, and it's kind of awkward. And Justin would be like dude, I'm right here, right? If I was telling you about Justin, you know, and talking about him, and he's right there, he'd be like, could you please stop? I, I can hear, right? Can you imagine what it was like for this guy? This man was a person. He was not a subject, and Jesus would have none of what the disciples were doing. He wasn't going to allow their motive to go unexposed. He was going to expose the motive of that question. And what Jesus does in this is he kind of lays out what's going on internally, and I love that. So kind of asking maybe it prompts a question within them of, you know, why would you ask that question? Is there a curiosity of how did this befall this person? Can I have an explanation? Is it because you're looking at him and say, clearly God judged this person, and and I haven't been judged, so maybe he's a bad person, and what have I done so right? We don't talk that way in church because it sounds wrong, but we think it in our hearts. And they did the same thing, and Jesus looks at it, and he's like, ah, there's something wrong in your theology. There's something wrong in your understanding of God. And we see it in his answer. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be shown in him. Jesus begins to correct their concept of what's going on. Bad things happen to bad people. And good things happen to good people. Unfortunately, the reality is the sun shines on the face of the wicked and the righteous alike. Right? Good things and bad things happen to us all. And Jesus corrects this. Jesus wants them to know that God will be glorified through his brokenness, which should be a ray of hope for you and I, who are so broken that there is, there's going to be God glorified in this. Jesus doesn't want his disciples to just know stuff about people, like they're a subject on a spreadsheet. Jesus wants them to know the person because Jesus wants them to connect them that person to him. He wants, Jesus wants to be in relationship with the individual they're talking about. And what I love in this is Jesus really sets the stage to go toe-to-toe with the religious elite. We call them in Scripture Pharisees. They wore all the right clothes. They had all the right answers. They knew all the right Scripture, and they even memorized the good book on prayer. They had it together, and they were really, really good 
But Jesus didn't like them. He doesn't like the religious. Now, there is a a difference between the faithful and the religious. The religious have their structure. Jesus doesn't like those who just appear so good on the outside. You know what Jesus actually called them in Mark uh, 23, verse 27? He refers to to the Pharisees. He says to them, look at you, your whitewashed tombs, you bones on the inside, and everything unclean in there, but you look really good on the outside. I mean, talk about a way to pick a fight in a theocracy, a world that is only upheld by the theology. Israel was fully a God state. So for Jesus to impugn their character and say, you look good on the outside, but you're dead inside is incredibly insulting. So when Jesus says this, what would the disciples say? That this man didn't do anything wrong, but God was going to be glorified. God's purposes in his brokenness was to glorify himself. The better way to say it for you and I is maybe to ask this question. Because we, we wouldn't say it the way the disciples do, but in their context, it was okay. But you and I might say it this way. Why is my neighbor so poor and like their life seems hard? Why are they always, maybe they're not as responsible as me and God can't trust them as much as he can trust this guy We don't like to talk that way, but it's what we think. I'm going to take your silent stares as an agreement because we look at people and think, boy, I wonder what's going on in their life. God is not happy with you. We don't say it out loud. We're not as dumb as the disciples were, but we think it in our heads. And the reality is, is Jesus is unpacking and saying, wait a minute, you have it all wrong. You have it all wrong. So Jesus goes on to say, as long as it is day, We must do the works of him who sent me, the heavenly father. Night is coming when no one can work. Now, we need to remember, it's harvest season. Has anybody driven by a cornfield about 11 at night out there and you see these big lights off these massive harvesting machines? Anybody seen that recently? I love seeing it. They're out there and they're harvesting all hours of the day because now with lights, you can do that. In the ancient world, it was dark. You got a candle And if you could afford a candle, that was awesome, unless it's windy, right? Because you had to be like this, oh, I'm putting a bushel over it. It's no good. It it does no, you know, it, it was dark. So when it's night, it's really dark in the ancient world. And Jesus is saying, it's gonna get dark. But while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus, I am the very first word of creation. After saying this, he spit on the ground made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So the man went, washed, and came home seeing. Whoa. We love to do church poorly, don't we? Uh, Who spits in dirt? Mm-hmm. Oh, Jesus wouldn't do that, would he? I won't make you, but it gets a little gamey after a few minutes, doesn't it? You have this mud, kind of nasty. It's bad enough on my hands, but what if I walked up and went, Root, and gave you eye black? You'd be like, hang on a second. I don't want that on my face. Have we ever recognized just how weird this is, what Jesus does. He spits on the ground and makes mud. Have you ever yelled at your kid, knock it off, that's gross, don't do that kind of stuff. We're good people, we have a nice reputation in this town. You don't just hawk one on the street, son, (laughs) right? What happens when Jesus spits on the ground and then kind of starts working with it? And then, after making the world's most awkward mud ball, starts rubbing it on a blind dude's face. We good with this? No, we're not good with this. We wouldn't like this. We keep everything just so in our theology and our understanding of God, but the reality is the man had mud put on his face. And then Jesus says to a person who cannot see, go, go. He had to look like a raccoon. People had to look at him and think, 
Well, that's just a mean thing to do to someone that is lame. He found his way through the streets with a super dirty face, but why? Why would someone do that? How did he know that he would be healed? How did he know? What would you do if you had some, something going on and Jesus healed it in a way you didn't want him to do and it was very public? He had to walk through town, through the people, to the pool to wash. Why was this blind man so sure? What did he see that we miss? What made him able to take the leap? He took a leap. He went and found the pool. Can you imagine him asking through town where the pool is, trying to find his way, trying to work his way through it? See, faith is a leap. It is difficult, and quite often in our carefully measured West Michigan lives, we want life to be just so. And we're all working towards a condo in Florida that eventually we're too old and sick to travel to anymore that we sell off. Our kids grieve because they lose spring break freedom. And then we move back and hopefully people come to our funeral. That is not the goal of this carefully measured life. Life for the Christian is a leap into the unknown. Knowing that we may see it as unknown, but he doesn't. Remember, he's the light of the world. And as long as he's here, He sees just fine, but he calls us according to his purposes, not according to ours. And he calls this man to take a leap. And when it comes to faith, your first few steps leaping out are always precarious. I think of a baby mountain goat coming out of the den for the first time being like, so this is our front porch? You know, like fall off a cliff because they're right on the mountainside. But their first few steps are precarious but then they get sure-footed. And then they run around the cliffs that we look out and think, I could never do that. And if you're afraid of heights, you just fall limp in a chair. You can't take it. Because you're like, how could you do that? Because for them, it's normal. For us as Christians, it should be normal that we take a leap of faith. This man's life should speak to us in such a way that we feel envious that we haven't leapt with him. Read on with me. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like himself. But he insisted, I am the man. So no matter what, now he can see and he's like, so you still talk about me as though I'm not here. They're like, isn't that Bob the beggar? Yeah, it's me. (gasps) You know, like he's talked to him. He's like, wait a minute, I am the guy. I know who I am. How were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes, and he told me to go to Siloam and to wash. So I went, and I washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked. I don't know, he said. Now imagine with me, he's probably figuring out what is that giant ball in the sky that burns my face? It's the sun. He doesn't understand. He he wouldn't have the, the spatial understanding. He's figuring things out and they're peppering him with questions. They're peppering him. I don't know, he said. So they go to the Pharisees, or they bring him to the Pharisees. They brought the man born blind. Now the day on which Jesus made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Who here grew up in West Michigan in the 70s and 80s? Okay, keep your hands up. No, keep your hands up. If you could swim in the 70s and 80s on this Sunday, keep your hand up. The Sabbath, right? Pagan, Greg. All right, so, sorry, you're not a pagan, Greg. I've known you for, I feel bad. I like, Greg's not a pagan. He's the one who fixed the leak on State Street after the sermon. All right, so, um, so Sabbath. All these rules to take a day of rest. Now, I want to tell you, God loves the Sabbath. The Sabbath allows us to have distinction from the end of one week to the beginning of another. None of us should be the dowager from uh, Downton Abbey, what is a weekend? We should all have the ending of a week, a day of rest to prepare for what's to come and reflect on what was. Jesus did this healing on the Sabbath. It's important that we understand this. Okay. 
I lost myself. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied. I washed, and now I can see. I washed, and now I could see. I think it's, it's amazing because the Pharisees are, are not doing well here. And they say, this man is not from God. He does not keep the Sabbath. He, do, he swims on Sunday in 1982 in Zealand. And not only that, I think he got his head wet and didn't wear church clothes. There's people I've talked to who are like, we could swim, we just couldn't splash, appear to have fun, or we had to, you know, like stay in nice clothes. And I'm like, oh my word. I would have been thrown out of every church. Um, because, like, you know, they, he doesn't keep the rules. But others ask, how can a sinner, they're accusing Jesus of this, perform such signs? So they were divided. They find themselves divided. And Jesus didn't do the religiously correct thing. He did something that pleased God and shattered human tradition. I want you to hear that again. Jesus did something that pleased God and wrecked human tradition. And they hated him for it. Obedience or tradition? That's the real question. Will we fail forward in the world's eyes being obedient to Christ? Will we do what Jesus loves even if some other people hate it? Jesus' actions cause division because he didn't follow the rules. He didn't do everything that you're supposed to do. But the reality was, the reality was that it left people who had all their rules set and their religion carefully formed questioning and curious about Jesus. They turned to him again. They turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about Jesus? It was your eyes that he opened. And this is what he says. He is a prophet. Now remember, just a couple verses ago, he said, this man called Jesus, it's kind of a, I don't know, a little bit of a pronoun out there, a little bit opaque and hard to define who Jesus was. Now it's getting clear. He was a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been born blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They ask. Is this the one you say was born blind? And how is it that he can now see? We know he is our son, the parents answered. And we know that he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. And the parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged Jesus Christ as the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. And that's why his parents said, ask him, he's of age. Look at his parents. They don't want to get booted out of synagogue. It would be like being thrown out of the church community for saying the wrong thing. They don't want to get tossed out either. They're afraid that they're going to be in trouble. So their struggle opens our eyes to something. Religion demands conformity. But the reality for us is that faith demands obedience into action. Religion demands conformity. We do this, we don't do that. Faith demands an obedience into the unknown. It demands an obedience and allegiance to Christ that will make this life thoroughly uncomfortable for you and I. The question is, do we seek conformity and structure or kind of life on the ragged edge of being faithful to Jesus Christ. A second time, they summoned the man who had been born blind. One of my friends, this is his favorite line, he'll call me and say, give glory to God by telling me the truth. And then they'll ask his question, I love it. But they say this, give glory to God by telling the truth, they said, we know this man's a sinner. Do you notice they didn't ask a question? Give glory to God by telling the truth, this man's a sinner. They... English people, grammar, is that good? Or is there a question, this man's a sinner? Or is this man's a sinner? See, they're not asking you or him for an opinion. They're telling him what he thinks. They're saying, give glory to God by telling the truth. This man's a sinner. And what we get out of this is probably one of the best lines and one of the truest things that I've ever heard of anyone who comes to know Jesus Christ. 
He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Jesus opened his eyes, and the reality this man lived with is that Jesus' work had done something he couldn't explain, but it changed everything. Have you ever encountered Jesus in that way? You can't really explain it to people, but you're so eager for them to know who this Jesus is. What's hilarious in this, and hilarious I say because I wasn't there, is that they call him names. They go after this guy. I mean, just look. Then they ask him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Like they they start getting after him. But here's what we get to kind of celebrate for a minute. Here's what he knew. He was blind before he met Jesus, but now he can see. Let's just go back and let Scripture shine a light on Scripture for a minute. What was the very first work of creation? Who did Jesus say that he was? He was the light of the world. Jesus' miracle here is rooted in the original act of creation. He gave light to the eyes and opened the darkness into light and removed the chaos from unknowing. He opened the eyes of this man. Jesus' miracle was rooted in the first act of creation. And there's a second reality that the Holy Spirit working through Jesus always does something, his work always reveals something true of God. So not not only does this validate the creation narrative, it validates part of what God does. For those who are in darkness, a great light has come, Isaiah 9. God is interested in bringing light into the darkness, and he does it here again. So they come back to him. What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I've told you already and you didn't listen. Can you, have you ever had a teenage kid who you assumed did something wrong but they actually didn't and they're like, mom and dad, I promise. They get exasperated and they're frustrated. You're not listening. That's what he's saying. Why do you want to hear it again? This is one of the greatest comebacks ever. Why do you want to hear it again? You want to become his disciples too? Have you ever wanted to land a verbal punch that just like sends people to whop, you know, just knocks them over? This is awesome. Why do you want to know again? Do you want to be there to say his disciples too? And you can feel like, anybody seen Little Mermaid? Remember at the end when uh, Prince Eric, aptly named, um, he takes the, the trident of Triton and he shoots and he shoots, floats them and jets them, the little eels, poof, and she's like, and Ursula, my babies, and, and they explode. And what happens? She gets mad and she's like, ah, ah, and she starts expanding and ink comes out. That's what I picture when he asks this. Do you want to be his disciples too? Ah, mm, we are disciples of Moses. We are disciples of Moses. You are this guy's disciple. Do you see how they get super reactive? They're crazy angry. We have Moses. We know that God spoke for Moses to Moses. But for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And it was kind of an insult because everybody knew Jesus was the boy born to a virgin in Nazareth, Joseph's son. See how they dig at him a little? And the man answered said, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. I mean, you can see the Pharisees. You can see the sweat rings in the robes. They are getting angry here because they can feel their argument coming undone. They can feel it coming undone. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin from birth. I love, thank you for laughing, Erica. Think of this. So who here drinks tea? Yeah, my British friends. All right, so this is what we have. When you take a tea bag into hot water and you put it in, it changes the color of the water. It makes it more tasty and delightful and refined. And, and it's tea, right? You steep the tea. You, you let it transform the water into tea. That's what they're saying. 
They got so mad. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they like hiked up their robes and like, look, you, ugh, you were steeped in sin from birth. We can tell who you are. How dare you lecture us? We're the religious elite. They are up here in their heads. And they threw him out. They threw him out. Now, they turn on the one who has given glory to Jesus. And think of how costly this would be. Their insults are misdirected because this man wasn't steeped in sin. He had actually kind of been steeped for the first time in the Holy Spirit. His life was alive with the Holy Spirit. He was giving witness and testimony to Christ, and it had to hearken back to Isaiah 43, 12, where he said, you are my witnesses that I am God. When I hear that scripture, I'm like, that has to be kind of rolling around in there. Pharisees knew the scriptures inside and out, and he was a witness that he is God, and they hated him for it. They hated him for it, but it's a scary moment when you look at the Pharisees because what they controlled was everything. They controlled everything in this man's life. When you get thrown out of synagogue, it's like getting fired, becoming a social pariah online. It's like getting thrown off any you know, teams you're on, any school you're in, and completely exiled from the community. It's like having a really bad skin condition in a hot tub. Nobody wants to be in area. You're just like, oh, yeah, we're good. I think I'll soak later. And they take off. Why? Because you are a pariah. Nobody wants you. You're the worst of the worst. This man got thrown out because of his witness to Christ. So Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, so get this, Jesus hears this guy's been pitched out of the synagogue, and Jesus goes on a hunt for him, and he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he? Who is he? The, the question comes back, who is he? Have you ever wondered that? Who is Jesus? And then he says what so often we fail to kind of follow up on. Tell me who he is so that I may believe in him. And Jesus, this is one of the coolest things, says, you now have seen him. Remember, he was blind earlier in this day. And now he's looking God in the face. He is the one speaking with you. And the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. He opened the spiritual eyes of a man who didn't know about the Messiah or what was going on. He was worried about the very next thing. How am I going to eat today? Jesus opened the eyes of this man born blind. So what we have to do is look at this and understand what Jesus is doing. For judgment I have come into this world so the blind will see and those who see will become blind. The Pharisees take great offense at this and they get very angry because it questions their structure. But what I want to do is apply this with you. There should be a progression in your faith. Remember we talked about the little billy goat stepping out onto the ledge? Feels scary. Feels like there's a big drop, maybe socially, if you confess Christ and you don't know what that means in this world. You step out on shaky legs. But I want to tell you something. In a progression of faith, when you come to Jesus Christ as you are to meet him as he is, you are made clean and whole and forgiven for all your past and all your future like that by the blood of Christ, by nothing you do but by his work. You are made new. But from that point, there should be a progression of faith where you grow into the relationship. Did you notice this man's growth after his first encounter with Jesus? They, referred, they said, who did this? And he said, this man named Jesus came and put mud on my eyes. Later on, they're asking him the same questions. How do you see? And he said, uh, this Jesus did it. Well, who is Jesus? He's a prophet. Do you see how his testimony's increasing? Finally, they begin to hurl insults and do different things, and this man rises up and gives a faithful rhetorical argument on who Jesus is and how he's not only not a sinner, but he must be directly from God because the works he does testifies of something God does. Because do you recognize Jesus' miracle in his life is the exact same thing that happened on the first act of creation? Into the darkness and the chaos of that man's life, light came. And God brought light to his eyes. But then the Holy Spirit uses that to reveal something of God. 
And this man begins to do that through a progression of his faith. He began to give witness to God time and time again. It harkens back to Isaiah 43, 12. Isaiah 43, 12 says, by your witness, they will know that I am God. By your living witness, they will know that I am God. And the Pharisees had to be pulling their hair out because this uneducated beggar is sitting there giving a beautiful explanation of who God is and why he matters and what Jesus did. And when he finally gets to the point of seeing Jesus face to face, he fell in worship. There should be a progression in our faith where we not only are set free and saved, but we begin to live with his vision for this world, finding where God's at work and joining him in it and our lives giving a faithful witness to him even if the religious elite hate it and throw us out of community, so be it. It's better to be obedient to the one who loves us than faithful to a structure that's indifferent. The second thing I want to invite you to do is leap. Leap into faith. If Jesus is pulling at your heart, I have to ask, are you at a point where you're supposed to take your first step in faith? Are you supposed to respond to the grace of Jesus Christ today? and come to know him as your savior and begin your progression of faith. If you've walked away from Christ and you've not been a faithful witness, is today your day to stand up and say, okay, I am called, I know Jesus Christ, it's time for me to live in light of who he is, not in light of what I want. Are you ready to take a leap? The man had mud smeared on his face that smelled like the spit of another man and wandered through the streets looking for the pool to wash in taking a leap that he would see differently. And I want to say something to you as a church and to me as a person. We cannot expect God to do all the work in our faith. He has saved us and done the full work, but we are required to leap into the arms of him who died on our behalf. There is a leap that is required on behalf of us to trust that not only does he have our best interest at heart, his kingdom purposes will come through the way we live faithfully, leaping obediently forward. It's scary, but the Pharisees wouldn't do it. How sad does their life look? How empty did their religious structure feel by the end of that that chapter? They felt like empty tombs, as Jesus said. They're screaming insults because it doesn't line up with what they want it to be. Jesus isn't going to be convenient, easy, or something that keeps you in the social norm. He's going to push you to the edges of society. Because as we know, there are many spiritual orphans in this world. And their Heavenly Father desires that we would go and be part of their knowing Him. We have to leap forward believing God is invested in this. Why? The final thing. We believe in failing forward. We believe in failing forward. We believe that when God tells us to do something, we must be obedient even when it gets us booted out of good circles. Even when it causes us to be people who are socially marginalized because we're giving witness to Christ in all that we do. Isn't it worth it? Isn't it worth it? Because I believe that it's never a failure to obey the Lord but it is the cataclysmic global failure to obey a structure that we build that says this is how you worship God. In this way only, we know this, that Jesus Christ in spirit and truth came and invited people into a relationship based on faith. And scripture as our witness and guide calls us to worship him, but also know that we are filled with the Holy Spirit to see the transformation of this world. So my question is to you, will you conform to the religious norm, the societal norm, or will you obey? Religion demands conformity. My question for you is, will you obey in faith the one who died while you were yet a sinner? Will you live for him in such a way that the world will see and know not only who he is, but his love for them? Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, this story. Thank you that you opened the spiritual eyes of someone who had never um, dreamed or hoped of encountering you. Thank you, God. Lord, we confess that oftentimes we will um, not understand, not honor the name of Jesus the way we should. 
What a gift the name of Jesus is. What an amazing thing it is to give witness to him. So Lord, we ask now as we step back and we spend a moment in worship where our worship is fixated on the beautiful name of our Lord and Savior, that you would convict our hearts and you would call us out of a conformity and into an obedience, into a living relationship so that we would know you in relationship and make you known in the many relationships we have. Come, Lord Jesus Christ, and receive what is, always has been, and always will be yours and yours alone. It is the worship of your people gathered in your name. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. Sing with me. Something dawned on me in this, uh, in this teaching today, and, and I'm going to close with it. This person wouldn't have been educated. They would have known nothing of the religious systems. They would have known it. They would have heard about it, but he wouldn't have known the scriptures because he could have never re- read them. He, he would have been outside of society. And what blows my mind is when he met Jesus and he continued with Jesus, his witness just grew. Not because he knew it, but because he was encountering it. He was encountering something true of God and it was changing the world around him. And I think the church can change the world around it if we would just stay encountered with Jesus, if we would let him be at the bright center of all that we are. And we could give witness well beyond our education, our influence, and our years if we would simply be beholden and faithful to the one who came and gave light into the darkness. In that world, the words of Isaiah still apply, that into darkness a great light has come. And the reason the great light has come is because you, the church, are gonna go and bear witness to him who is the high king of heaven. Amen? Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is time for the church to leave the building and shine the light. You are dismissed.